time, one more time. Um, great to be here. This is the last um, lecture of this series, as some of you might know. We started in August with Erin Ku and we're closing tonight with uh, Christian Michael. This is the 13th lecture of uh, this series on continuity. Um, let me start with a few lines by Christian Michael uh, that I read somewhere. Um, in colleges and degree programs in India, we always depend on European, Japanese, and Chinese history and models of ceramics, and do not look at our own culture and traditions. It is vital to our understanding of why contemporary Indian craft is still in need of revival. With all government policies from the time of independence, by following the precedence, precedence set by the British, we have still not been able, we have still not been successful in holding the crafts, in, sorry, in helping the craftspeople. Um, I guess this is um, something that we'll get a chance to come back to tonight in this discussion <coughs> of. Um, the way ceramic culture and the history of ceramic works in India can help us understand continuity from craft to art and from art to society and other questions. There are other questions such as this one. Um, Christine Michael has been a very a seminal uh, ceramic artist for a long time now, over 20 years. She's also a ceramic historian. Um, she was formed in the industrial ceramic design in uh, NID, uh, National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. And she practiced with uh, Alan Kegger Smith at the Under Master Pottery in England and uh, Delhi Blue Pottery with Guru Chanan Singh in Oroville as well and in, at the Golden Bridge Pottery in Pondicherry with uh, Ray Maker and Deborah Smith, where she could uh, larger, more deeply um, get into practices of uh, wood firing and uh, stoneware glazes. She's also a multidisciplinary artist uh, with uh, trainings in uh, vegetable dyeing from Bangalore and in the visual arts from Uganda and China. And some of her later works are in um, digital imagery. Her works have been uh, displayed and exposed in a variety of collections around the globe, in England, in Korea, in the US, in um, Austria and other countries, um, in solo and group exhibitions. She also conducted a series of workshops and uh, received a number of awards. She's also an important writer on contemporary ceramic art, on the history of ceramic art, and um, she's also uh, currently the curriculum leader of visual and performing arts at the British School here in New Delhi. And to close uh, this introduction on Christian Michael with another quote, let me read this. Throughout this creative journey, I have maintained a dialogue with my inner self, trying to make sense through my art, translating haunting human experiences like a fractured search for meaningful construction with nature's sensory and sensual evidence around me. And it is very interesting that this talk which was supposed to happen in October got uh, postponed and finally happened today. Just a few days after we published the first uh, dialogue on our platform of translocal dialogues uh, where we have uh, weekly publications on Fridays. Um, and we featured a text by um, Priya Ravish Mera, who is a textile artist working with threads. And she was explaining exactly the same thing, uh, how after certain events in her life, she started deciding to, to actually display, leave the threads visible, even the unwanted threads, even the leftover. And um, it's, also, it's also an occasion to tell you that uh, we will start uh, with Dela, working with the artists closely for different types of programs and uh, you'll get to hear about this very soon 
and the three other which I would be the first. And um, speaking of uh, interactions, I can do the transition to Naman Ahuja, whom we are really happy to have tonight. He also wrote um, for this platform about six months back in August. Um, and in exchange with the, the photography and video artist and performer uh, Pushpa Mala from South India, on uh, an ambiguous, oh, sorry, on an ambitious, but maybe also ambiguous <laughs> um, topic, transcreating the body, allying the human and the cosmic. And very simply, I asked uh, Naman if he could just give us some ideas as to the question. Can we understand the body as the locus of uh, divine beauty? And he complied. Um, Naman uh, many of you must know, he's a, an important art critic, curator, and he's a professor in JNU in uh, Indian art history. Um, his PhD was uh, in art history from London University. <coughs> an expert in uh, Indian iconography, sculpture and temple architecture. Uh, his teaching career brought him to the US, to Europe and to India. And he has created a series of uh, important uh, exhibitions. And the last one was uh, The Body in Indian Art, which was first shown uh, at the Palais de Boza in uh, Belgium, in Brussels. And later it came here in Italy, I guess some of you must have seen it at the National Museum um, in New Delhi. And um, we're very happy to uh, have him also because uh, through this publication that we had and through the discussion that we will have tonight, uh, we're able with them and we to bring together the art and all the traditions of uh, philosophy in India, um, trying to approach really concre concrete but also abstract metaphysical questions, fundamental questions through the art. And um, it's, not, it's an occasion for us to announce that we will have another type of new event, sort of uh, philosophy banner, uh, with uh, more people coming together and uh, trying to think deeply in new ways for our society of today. So I will leave the name to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samuel. Um, well, it gives me great pleasure and a proud privilege actually to be able to introduce Christine to you, who I have known for um, 20 odd years, actually, uh, if not more, when I must have been, um, no more than 20 years. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Christine and I know each other because she is a part of a different part of my life, a part of my life that I don't get to explore enough ever since I've become a, uh, an academic, um, which is an affinity and a love of clay and being able to work with clay and the medium. And Christine came to Devi Prasad's workshop um, studio to be able to educate me in the fundamentals of glaze technology and we conducted a very fruitful workshop, uh, which she conducted with us, one of her first workshops ever, I think, in which we went through um, a very particular series of experiments with material. And it was a fantastic workshop where a group of students, the Prasad and Christine and I and others got together, and we tried out every single possible type of clay and combinations with materials and glazes, and we worked for our way through an entire series of firings to be able to come to a better understanding of material and temperature and all of those things that students of ceramic technology do. Materiality, therefore, or the respect for that medium, is something that has undergirded much of the work that Christine has always done, which has ended up being explored through an entire history of ceramic traditions of the world, which she's tried to embody in different parts of her work. And she's really looked at some of the best. Um, the Khada 
which forms the basis of the NID its creation, to fabulous lusterware that Alan Cage Smith recreated, to the salt glazes and earthenware traditions that were resuscitated and perpetuated with Ray Mika in Botticelli, um, to the kind of work that we've seen explored in Andretta and Delhi Blue um, with Kushan Singh, traditions Japanese and Korean, traditions of English slipwear, um, which again have informed a lot of her practice. I think it's been extraordinary that I met a kindred spirit who was as much a practitioner as she has been a, a researcher. And a researcher who hasn't just actually researched the material through books, but through practice of recreating those forms of Cypriot ware and Nisha code ware and all of those different types of ceramic traditions of the world, which have informed her practice. And that, for me, allows us to connect because I, as the academic art historian, can talk to somebody who is practicing and continues to make in all of those different traditions. And the fact that somebody is so conditioned by medium and by so many disparate making traditions is in itself a very tricky thing for artists in today's climate who find themselves under an incredible amount of pressure to be stamped with a particular style, who find themselves under the pressure to be artists that galleries can represent. <coughs> and pottery and ceramics, per se, finds itself in this very curious limbo space, neither in fully accepted in the world of studio art, represented by the same galleries, nor in the world of the traditional maker of the ghar. And so for a series on the idea of artist continuity, I think Christine and her work pose for us, or epitomize, a series of theoretical questions that we as art historians, as critics, as people who work in the world of galleries find ourselves in this very tricky double bind with. What is it that we are seeking to represent? Continuity or tradition of, of a tradition? Or are we trying to celebrate only that modernist aesthetic which marks a break with tradition? <coughs> and since a lot of the work that, that potters do seems to constantly quote from and refer to older traditions of the world, which we with great pride seem to be able to want to emulate and embody and recreate, it brings back and makes prescient those discussions which were held at the turn of the century, of the last century, of the early 20th century, which saw the arts and crafts movement, and it almost seems that the ceramic artist of today remains in that space, in those polemics of where the arts and crafts movement was in the 1920s, 30s, and perhaps in the case of Studio Pottery with Bernard Leach and Yana Lee, perhaps slightly later up until the 40s and 50s. So it's quite nice that, <laughs> no, sorry, bad word. <laughs> it's wonderful <laughs> to be able to have this discussion with you over here. And thank you very much for being here.
to which I shall try to illustrate and link these layers of perception. Lots of friends in the audience today are also clay artists, and I hope that this will sort of resonate with their artistic journeys as well and deepen their understanding. You take it as it comes. You, you uh, take it as it comes and say yes to what you behold. Now this advice was given to me by, by, uh, by a man called Paulus, Paulus Berenson and of the uh, School of Crafts, Pendant. And it really resonated with me because I have been one of the many to consciously undertake a path with clay as the sort of material of my choice, as it makes us aware of both ourselves and of the ingredients of a process through which art is made. Clay urges you to a continuing practice with varying challenges of technique, firing, clay bodies, glazes, concepts, form and surface, which deepens and also renews our understanding of clay work each time. There is no chance of repeating, because for each time we come to life from another perspective. We learn not only to follow the nature of the clay, but to lead and guide it into our own way, finding an experience of ourselves that feels real with the help of this magical material and its companion, fire. You must not forget the fire, because clay and fire are like twins. To find one's way with clay is to integrate one's inner search with one's outer artistic expression and practice. And also techniques by itself tend to lead to dead ends, but art comes alive through a living source, which is the artist. We befriend the clay, and the clay befriends us. Have we chosen clay, or has it sort of kidnapped us? One finds oneself drawn to it so passionately that years of life are given to it, so much sacrificed in its pursuit. Surely there is an underlying myth, a story larger than oneself. Working with clay is a conscious slowing down of time, and in its intense focus, it is really like a meditation that awakens the sense of touch and fluid participatory nature of sense perception. Science tells us that there are 90,000 sense receptors per square inch of human fingertip. Imagine, 90,000 sense receptors working every time you touch clay, creating a consciousness which is transmitted from the fingertips of the maker to the fingertips of the user or else the viewer. I am asked many times about what the creative process that we as artists go through. How long did it take you to make? This is of course the classic question. As though the process of internalizing, conceptualizing, and also visualizing is something which is time-bound to the actual physical manufacture. Finding one's way with clay is a technical question. Which sort of method do I want to work with? It is also a question of style. How do I want this piece to look? And it is a deeper question. How do I relate, connect, express what is yet a thought into a physicality of form and mass and volume and surface. I have great respect for the history of man's, of man's relationship to clay. All the early pots have a deep link of origin to the material and human evolution. These are layered objects with a world of meaning hidden behind tantalizing form, surface and function. The clay, the clay connoisseur needs a visual and a tactile immersion in the work. It takes a while to take the form in its entirety, its grace, its sort of sophistication. One can admire the skill, but is it simply a functional article, or was the artist talking about an abstract idea, that of beauty? Both the forms of vessels and the types of content, <coughs> so connected with clay objects uh, historically, has intensified in the contemporary ceramic art movement, where the vessel form was equated with the human form and a container for abstract ideas. Such symbolism, which is embedded in the simplest and humblest of, of uh, water vessels, creates what is known as the transformation image, Philip Lawson said this, which he describes as the known, where layers of meaning, weaving, social culture, traditions and craft, as a metaphor, come all sort of together. The Indian water pot, or 
Lota has uh, epitomized the uh, refinement and also the minimal design qualities inherent in Indian aesthetic sensibilities over generations. It inspired the famous Charles Eames to choose this form as essentially Indian in actual design and metaphor. The form is very different to, to either the Chinese Korean oils or else the Japanese vase form. The lota is a functional object, whatever material it was made of, to carry water in small quantities for personal or ritual purposes. The form has been essentially unchanging, although it has many regional variations <coughs> in the sort of relationship of its parts, such as the vessel's neck, the spherical body, the articulation of the belly to the foot, and the upward rising neck. All parts of the vessel are named according to the conventions of the human body. We talk of the belly, the foot, the shoulder, the neck, the lip. This adds a subconscious connection to us. Bernard Leach speaks of the elements of the glaze, quartz, feldspar, and clay, being the flesh, blood, and bones of the matrix. And I quote from my favorite Doha from uh, Kabir, which explains, which explains the metaphoric volume and spatial connections. Within this vessel are the seven oceans and the unnumbered stars, the eternal sound and the spring wells up. Listen to me, my friend, the Lord is there with it. The most important theorist in, in the Mingle craft movement of the early 20th century, whose great impact on English, Japanese, and Indian view of pottery was, was Suet Suryanagi, who really discovered, the, as he says, the beautiful truthfulness of, of the domestic hand, handmade craft. His aesthetic was that of the seeing eye. Through his book, The Unknown Craftsman, he proposes a theory regarding artistic work and its qualification by beauty against a background of rapid industry and saw pottery as the essential spirit of man. He, sp he said, and he explained to a largely Western audience about the character <coughs> of beauty for all, for all Japanese people, about describing the Kizimon tea bowl from Edo, which you see over here, <coughs> his high expectation about seeing the centuries-old prized bowl when it was unwrapped layer by layer in silk and then in wooden box and then, <coughs> and then in silk again, his heart fell. It was just an ordinary tea bowl, what a common man would use every day. So he says, this pot is healthy, he said, made <coughs> for a purpose, made to do work, sold to be used in every day of life. His theory of the beauty of imperfection caused a ripple effect in the world of 20th century, uh, 20th century pottery. Tenshin Ogakura's Book of Tea, which also recommends the oriental sort of recon, uh, recognition of beauty of the imperfect, comes out of a background of Zen thinking and describes an aesthetic based upon simple, simple naturalness and also like a reverence that is equated to freedom. Freedom is beauty, he says, as the love of the imperfect is a sign of the basic quest for freedom. It is this beauty, he says, with inner in implications that is referred to as shibui, which can be translated as a combination of austere, subdued, restrained, simplicity, and purity. An object should show in the spirit of Buddhism motion and, st motion and stability, stability in motion, or the eloquent silence. While explaining the importance of objects in the, the tea ceremony, he says that tea taught people to look and handle objects of sort of function <coughs> more carefully than they had before. And it inspired in them a deeper interest and greater respect for those objects. Tea formulated criteria for actually recognizing beauty through form, color, and also design. In the early tea bowls, the masters perceived the, the virtue of beauty, sorry, the masters perceived the virtue of poverty in the world of beauty, which was called Shibusa. Most tea masters prefer the incomplete. They look for the slight scars or the irregularities of form. He also, Okakura also quotes, quotes Kabir, our, our poet, in his chapter on the Buddhist idea of uh, beauty. And I'll show you one of my works now. Now we move in, into my work as well. So a group of my work, which is also combining Shibui and also Shibusa. 
Now, now Suetsu also unpacked the perfection of Sungwe that was never signed, however beautiful it may have been. Here is Suetsu at his absolute best, rhetorical best, linking spiritualism and craftsmanship. Rather than attribute the quality of the work to the personal ability of the potters, he concluded that it was the world in which they lived in that not only protected them, but also contributed to their success. His theory was that the Sung potters were working in a world where identity is not of importance. The submissive reliance on, uh, on uh, tradition also resulted in the beauty of their, of, uh, their accomplishment, he says. He draws a parallel between beauty and function, which was echoed in the actual modernist sort of discourse of uh, the Western Bajau style design. Now, in India, as, as in 19th century Japan, it is regional characteristics of shape, clay quality, decorative markings, and the indefinable subtle insinuations of form and embellishment that specify the origin of the object made by the hand of the unknown maker. Now this shift from the unknown maker to the signature at the base of the pot as a sign of the burgeoning artist, this is, this is one of our first examples that we have, um, dated circa 1850, was one that must be laid at the door of the five early art schools of India. They were in Bombay, Madras, <coughs> Jaipur, Lahore, and Calcutta in the early 19th century. Studio pottery can be defined as a 20th century movement where both the craftsman and the artist combine in the one artist who tries to strike a balance between the unselfconscious functional vessel making tradition of uh, pottery and the acceptance of the established hierarchy of the high art mediums of painting and sculpture. And here you see for the first time in, in these strange hybrid pots that came out of the early art schools, you see the sort of, the painting that comes on it, the, the sort of going back to the Ajanta frescoes and those early, those early um, sort of painting, the entire painting narrative which is where, which is on, which is on these pots. The image of the artist has been stereotyped first by technique, expressed in the term of craft, which means skill. And in the sense of being an artisan, it is a necessary skill to have. Its link with function is perceived as precluding its ability to be art. But it has also been associated with the arts and crafts hobby type of activity. Now the final factor contributing to clay's separateness is the use of clay as a basic medium in art, in art education cheap and readily available with which art students could explore questions of 3D design. Although this has allowed artists who were headed towards one or the other art sort of mediums to ease into clay, it has also led to the disregard of the medium as a serious one. Clay has been seen as either just a practical material. I have been fortunate to have studied under under uh, under, uh, under Dasha Patel at the NID who constantly pressed the need through his work for a thorough understanding of the history, culture, tradition, aesthetics and the lifestyle that modern India had also inherited and of a vision of what the responsibilities for the future were. His keen understanding of Indian aesthetics of form and function were what has inspired me in, in the actual delineation of my forms where every curve is absolute, every curve is definite. Every change of direction of the shape based on function and also beauty. Where an element of surprise greets you at the choice of color, the surface, the texture, at each point of departure of the form as you handle it or view it. Now this understanding has informed all of my work in both functional wear and also my sculptural, <coughs> sculptural vessels. The power of nature. Space like time has occupied the Indian mind for a very long time. Sky and earth are not fixed, but the expanding and shrinking of space. Nature is just not an echo of human sentiments and moods, but is encapsulated in landscape, crystalline, small sort of, sort of miniatures. The, the Hiranya Garba, or the cosmic egg of heaven and earth, the Shaligram, the seed of creation. 
nature in the form of shells and seeds and also fossils have always informed my understanding of form and texture. The spiral in nature has always inspired me as a complex form. The placement of my work in gardens, under trees, in sand, has always been an important element of my exhibition design around my work. Installations were, have, have, have been a part of my work for years now. And this group, which is called, which is called the Rites of Passage, 500 black moths made in Rakhun clay, hung over the viewer or hung in strips as a curtain or under a tree <coughs> as a layer between earth and sky. The forms change according to where they're hung, the sort of locations that they're at, the context that they are in. And, and uh, my public art projects, first for the Garden of Five Senses in Delhi, were the wind sculpture <coughs> with a double helix spiral <coughs> and bells. The bells sit in a metal frame, which is 30 feet in height. The color blue was meant to match the color of the sky and air, as well as the flowers around the nail bark. And actually, the double helix spiral is the DNA, molecular basic structure of all the matter of uh, the universe. That's, that's why the metal frame was of, of that shape. The bells are 115 number and were made in colored porcelain in shades of blue. has a garden of Eden where there is the forces of good and evil. Beauty cannot live in the world without its opposite, ugliness, life without death. The serpent winds itself in, up, and through the rock. It is made of glazed clay in, in segments which are attached to the rock in such a manner as to have the feeling that the serpent is, you know, sort of coming out of the natural rock. of Indian painting, the simultaneous presences of the same person in different places uh, involves and shows many aspects of time. Time moves in a cyclical fashion, which also manifests itself in, in the adoption of continuous pictorial rendering. These different moments of time, and therefore sequential, are set next, next to each other without being, without being separated. And, and this is something I try to do with my murals. Notions of time as being something that you, that you can manipulate, which is uh, elusive, and also the bodhisattva, the female, the female personification of wisdom. I was inspired by the Indus Valley mother goddess figurines and the interpretation of female energy and power in Shakti shown in these figures. The first mural I made was called Soul Sisters and consists of these small figures in small containers or sort of compartments, seated, standing on shelves, sort of zoned in, intensely focused in meditating, playing, swimming in primordial waters. This mural is called, is called Vitruvian Woman, after, after Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, but uh, with a twist, with the female energy there as the center of the world, the core of the world. My work on the female form continues as individual figures of torso, and animal-woman combinations. The female form becomes more abstract with sort of contrapostal delineations in these rainbow serpent woman groups. From early on, I was fascinated by how groups of forms relate to each other. The new negative shapes appearing when placed together, creating new meanings or sort of relationships. The figure alone and the figure in her own space or in a group. <coughs> The figure turned into a vessel, a torso. 
so. We go around circles. And here you have figures as, as a tall jug with a strong torso and, and an attitude. Work and with the form. So the work was not austere, but it was also not sort of ornamental. And my focus began to look for sort of commonalities with my Indian aesthetics. My early work in Delhi and Pondicherry was based on altering the wheel thrown vessel, but still keeping a largely functional aspect. With the treasure chest series, With the treasure chest series, um, I started working on layers and vessels and an element of surprise inherent in the interaction of the object with the user. The shapes were based on, on sort of bell metal forms of lamps from South India and Rajasthan. Animal handles and extensions created new tensions in, in the vessel versus sculpture dynamics. And I began to thoroughly enjoy the narrative the story going on within my work. Preoccupation on the on the cornucopia of nature in all its in all its multiplicity and also grandeur of form is countered with a fascination with the blankness and gaudiness of the plastic surface. I played with ceramic glazes to encourage the feeling of plastic on sort of genetically modified fruit and vegetables. The the politics of migration and cultural identity versus a versus a national identity can be parallel between the natural world and also, and also humanity. Seeds and plants that the colonizers carried back to their native and other countries have over generations become incorporated into cuisine, landscape and myth. Some of the most basic taken for granted everyday fruit and vegetables that are quintessentially so national today were also from somewhere else. And it's the same with people. The question to be raised here is what is original? What is traditional? What is native in the world today? So the Cornucopia series has tried to has tried to depict this plasticization of fruit into mutated hybrids. The overflowing fruit basket is an image that we carry in our minds of wealth, everlasting wealth, prosperity, fertility. 
Cradle Song was a group of pairs and pillows where the relationships of form, again, were, were a strong fascination to me when they, when they became multiples. Now, each person has their own system or process. The notion of artistic or you know, creative process has been the subject of much debate and research as that of the nature of art itself. Is it by nature spontaneous, or does, or does creativity consist of the original use of accomplished technique? All art consists of a concept in a medium. The concept is what the artist wants to express and show to the audience. It may be whatever it is, but the medium is only the mode of expression, or else communication used by the artist to convey the concept at hand. Now first is a technical understanding of the medium. This consists of knowledge of the materials that the artist is working with, and also a knowledge of how it may, it may be manipulated to fit the conception or else the idea. In uh, the case of painting, this might include a knowledge of the behavior of different types of paint and the degree to which they can be mixed, or an appreciation of how paint transfers from a brush to a canvas. In the case of ceramics, for example, it is the making of the clay and the glaze, and most importantly, the firing process through kilns, and the control of the effects of fire. Every fire and firing is a unique event to be listened to and spoken with. We learn by doing it repeatedly and analyzing it, but eventually when you open the kiln, you prepare yourself to behold the unexpected. It is a fine paradox for me. On the one hand, we have a, we have a vision, and we work for a control and an articulation that may allow that vision to come to life. But on the other hand, we have the events of the fire that are unique, most often not at all predictable, and that have the grace of revealing visions beyond our own. So the fire becomes collaborator, enemy, teacher, or tool. We make our choices, and they are made for us by the fire. Some understanding of the medium is also, is also necessary for the production of art, but it is not all about technique and skill. There is much risk-taking, much daydreaming and visualizing, a great deal of play and fun, making mistakes and learning from what has not, as, not worked well as well from what has. And I would like to end as, as a full circle with my work on seed. Thank you for your patience, and I hope that you've enjoyed sharing my uh, journey with me. As, as my teacher, as uh, my teacher Dashit Patel said, the only limit is within you. Thank you so much. Really 
bogged down with um, you know technique and the firing and the glaze, the glaze recipes. And <coughs> anybody who's here will, will you know just you know sort of tell you that it takes so long to just get the technique in hand. And one tends to forget what you want to say with the material. And um, I think we have a hangover. We've been taught this hangover of uh, you know the humble pot. The, um, you know, the virtue of uh, the imperfect pot. The, uh, these, are all, these are all values that come along with learning the clay. How sort of relevant it is in uh, the 21st century, making, making ceramics, um, which now you can purchase your materials, you, uh, <coughs> you can have somebody else making your work for you, you can still be a, uh, be a ceramic artist and not actually make your work yourself. You could make it in China, for example. Um, and you know, I think that these are notions that are that are historical notions. But how much we as contemporary artists actually live that out ourselves? That's another matter, you know. Now, but I think that to know that that's where you've come from, I think that's important, you know. Um, and to really get out of materiality. But then again, you're working with form and mass and volume and surface. You're constantly working with surface. You're constantly struggling for that surface. It's a tricky paradox. I don't know if others have questions that they'd like to ask. Any? There's this constant refrain to nature. And that's the other thing in your book. And again, that shows this again, this sort of very deep respect for the elements, fire, nature, earth, clay. Um, it's, again, uh, a very much in keeping with the medium. And the medium is very often, you know, salt, and you name it in all of your work. I keep coming back to this fact that there is this very traditional, classical base that lies yeah. in your work which is guided by the politics of the meaning and the ethics of the medium. The medium really conditions. <coughs> and in terms of a lot of your work in your contributions as a scholar and as a historian of ceramics and the work that, work that you've been doing, again, it is about understanding the art through medium. And this happens more than anywhere. I mean, I know that the Royal Academy did a, a a progressive stroke atavistic exhibition recently called Bronze, where the, again medium was being explored as a subject matter for an exhibition rather than um, a theme or a period or an age or a place. Um, but it became again stretching what material and form can happen in respect to the medium. And clay as continuity seems to have been a metaphor that has been all through your. Um, I, I think that that's um, something that's sort of universal. It's um, clay and the human form, and as I, as I mentioned, the flesh, blood, and bones of the clay. And it's just constantly there. We grew up with it. I mean, it's been so many years uh, that uh, one keeps coming back to it. And um, yes, it's something that um, do we want to really, as sort of contemporary artists, shrug it off? Is, is uh, that the way forward? I don't know. I don't know really. Um, do we lose the entire connection with the medium? Uh, <coughs> when, where, when you know that also that also ceramics, you know, the head of the rocket core is made of ceramics. Uh, you know, the material has such a wide range. Uh, why are we working in those sort of, you know, sort of materials rather than? I don't really know. Those are questions that one has to ask a uh, sort of younger generation of ceramic artists mm -hmm. who, are, who are right here. I can see some of them sitting right here. Mm -hmm. As to, are you still hooked on to the old traditional, you know, the universality of nature, the natural forms, and or or do you think that the 21st century sort of ceramic artist can break this connection? Should we? Anything 
caught me off guard. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting uh, topic for your lectures, play as continuity. I think it's impossible in a way to break the bond. But at the same time, uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of resources we have is actually pushing it. Like for example, um, you know, like India has a tradi tradition of terracotta. India didn't have a tradition of fire ceramics. But with the coming of uh, kilns which can go very high and the coming of porcelain, uh, we are using these materials in very new ways. Uh, and I think it has to be a balance, I guess. Seriously enough, by um, 
the art critic, with, by the art critic, because this is what made it into uh, the neighborhood council block hobby center that allowed everyone to engage with um, uh, with play as a. But of course now it has been taken much more more seriously. And the amateur, the idea of the amateur becoming something that can be showcased and is a space of investigation in itself, is hopefully going to start allowing um, more of this to be exhibited. But I still wonder whether India, particularly, is ready for exhibitions and galleries to really start looking at the ceramic object and the pot more seriously. Because the reason I say this is because if you need to take it more seriously, you need to go beyond material and also engage adequately with form, which is as much a concern of the ceramic tradition. And again, formalism is making a comeback again in art history violence suddenly. And I wonder if the establishment in India can actually deal with what do you feel as a practicing artist? How has, what have been the responses that you've encountered? Well, I, I feel that the art, the art uh, so critic doesn't have a language to deal, to deal with ceramics. There is no language. They don't have it. You know, they can talk about craft, mm -hmm. and then they can, they can talk about, uh, you know, sort of, sort of Picasso's sort of dabbling in the south of France and making his jugs and his cubist uh, things. But to engage with this sort of thing, they haven't got the language. And it's actually so one of the reasons why I started, I started first writing uh, catalog articles for my friends, because they were not able to, to articulate it. So if the art, the art historian, the art sort of critic doesn't have the language, maybe the artist does. But as clay artists, we tend to be inarticulate and not really able to you know, express what, what needs to be said. I mean, there are very few people, maybe this Arjee was one of them, who was able to you know, make these linkages and make these sort of connections. And that's why I, I started to write for other friends and I started to research and go backwards, basically. Okay, here I am now. <laughs> now, what happened earlier? When did the sign book come in? When did, when did this whole craft and art thing happen? And so I have started working my way backwards. And, um, it's really fascinating to see that the galleries, some of them um, are extremely open and they know how to deal with it, uh, with clay work and they know how to do you that, know, but most of them uh, would tend to not sort of touch it. I mean, in a weird way, it's also... tend to not touch it in the past. Well, which is... Which, which preserves your integrity as an artist. You're unsullied and pure. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. You're not tainted by the market. We're not part of the stable. Stable and gallery artists. No, I think there are very few, there are very few ceramic artists who are part of a gallery stable. Did you ever feel a sense of betrayal when you stopped making utilitarian there? Do you feel that you were? Uh, no, not at all. In fact, it's a part of my, it's it's a part of my reals. When I start to make a sculptural work, I have to keep. I have to, you know, get into it first, and it's 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 like you do your skills, mm -hmm. do you know? So it's a part of my sadhana, uh, which I. Sit grammar. Yeah. Grammar. Tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm married to a ceramic scientist as well, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> trying to get to learn about it. But anyway, uh, my question is about actually uh, the fragility of uh, ceramics and the paradox that a soft <coughs> clay material becomes brittle and hard. And the fact that it can last centuries or millennium and just break. So, I mean, I'm mean, not very fascinated by this. I don't know if you have to add to that. Or, you know, um, well, it is, it, it's completely fascinating that it is the pottery shards that survive. Yeah. Not the fabric, not the anything else. You know, it's the pottery shards. And from there you make, I mean, as I said, if you hold a pot from the Indus Valley and you think that somebody 7,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago has actually made that and you're putting your fingers where their fingers were, it's a huge charge, at least it's a um, So there's that human connection. 
you know. And yes, it breaks, but you know, it's ephemeral. What is long lasting? We are not long lasting. What is long lasting? Why, why do we need to have a material that is long lasting? Actually, for the entire sort of, uh, you know, rural economy to, have to drink from a cooler and throw it gave actually the potter, you know, a reason to make more. Or, you know, to sort of um, throw away pots at the time of a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse. It gave a chance for the craftspeople to make, you know. So, what is fragility? When everything is ephemeral. Everything is ephemeral. Uh, this is about uh, the, the, the issue of education that you brought in. We are really looking at like how uh, the series itself is looking at how what lessons can be drawn from these spaces uh, which have continued over a period of time. So uh, in these times, you know, uh, Naman was mentioning the utilitarian uh, angle to this, like you know. So there is this functionality to this uh, thing which you immediately attach to this art. I mean, this this field, and suddenly you are in a in a ta in the times of uh, you know you would want you you can get ready access to certain things, so you don't have to really as you said spend time with your hands you know dirty your hands or anything. You can get ready access to certain things which you can put as a showpiece in your room or whatever. The utilitarian th function itself is a kind of uh, taken care of by other various other. So, uh, when we have moved away from that organic need to create your vessel or your thing with your hands, and then you are in this kind of a rather virtual space, <coughs> how do you really make this uh, possible for an educational space to even uh, access this uh, insight about this? How do you begin as a teacher? Or as uh, you know, we are also concerned about this. How do you really make this intervention? How do you begin to make this intervention now? Because it seems there has been a, as as a, a pot is broken and the shards are available. So how do you put them together now? Because it seems uh, it's all scattered here and there, and you can't really put them together. So how do you begin to begin to make this connection? Your call. <laughs> schools are trying to teach students. It's no longer enough to have a certain, certain amount of knowledge about a subject without knowing how to apply it. And any creative thinking skill is based on art. Art is all about that, thinking out of the box, um, synthesizing information, um, you know, sort of designing, um, all of that is, you know, putting things together, using it creatively. So everything is creative thinking. So. I think in education today there is a shift, there is a shift, but it's still not, you know, prevalent. It's, um, I think it needs to have much more. Naman, you would like to... <laughs> well, I think I'm not really equipped to answer that, um, to be honest. I feel there are people who have been working um, in child education, particularly. Um, we have great models of child education. I think Peri Prasad would have been far better equipped to be able to answer this question. Um, because a lot of his life was spent in trying to develop a particularly Indian way of thinking about education, right from the grassroots, which was made out of a sense of making. Um, the importance of being able to make anything that you require or need or desire, never to be able to buy it, but whatever it is that you want, you make, impressed Maria Montessori to a great degree. And the rest, as you know, is history in the field of child education. A lot of those experiments in trying to understand what that kind of pedagogy to train people in the very art of making would be about, a lot of the pioneering work on that was done at Sevagram, at Gandhi's ashram, through an interpretation of that our act and the desire, the way in which children must be educated. And it was Gandhi's 
ultimate post-colonial st stance for being able to create a new nation, which was that right from childhood, you create people who are brought up in a completely different educational mindset, which would be, which would engender a completely different ethic towards your understanding of your environment, to every little element in that environment, to being able to make and respect labor, um, to be able to make yourself and therefore become somebody who is respectful to, to others' labor. And it was going to, for him to be, he, he envisaged it as a complete antithesis to the way in which the modern education systems of the world were structured. Now, unfortunately, by the early 1960s, the Sevagram experiment in education was not something that Nehruvian India was interested in supporting. And that entire baby was thrown out with the bathwater because it had only really lasted for about 15 years of serious experimentation, and these things take much longer. But if you meet graduates from those early 15 years of Sevagram, and you interact with them, and you see the kind of work they do, and where they live, they are really very rewarding stories in themselves. And seeing the kind of, these were people who didn't have science teachers but became great medical, uh, great doctors. These are people who have, they're extraordinary people. And so indeed I do believe that <coughs> an understanding and an education system that is predicated on making has great benefit that really ought to be reopened. That entire chapter of India's education history and contribution should be reopened. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for giving your comments on the talk. I just thought the what Norman just said uh, seemed to bring us back in some ways to the question of skill. And that was a question I had earlier on about when we're get, becoming concerned about the kind of aura that we build around ceramic production, that it is somehow spiritual, and it is, and we've all felt it, those of us that have worked with clay. Uh, it does have a way of making you feel slightly humble, uh, but being humble is a very good <coughs> order. It's a full-time job, it takes a lifetime. Uh, it comes much more, you know, much less easily than it's spoken about. So there is that question, but, but I, there was an interesting kind of correlation there being drawn up between uh, acquiring skills and learning them, learning their historical context, and also attaching these other qualities to it in perhaps a superficial way. So I wonder in what you just said just now, Norman, whether it's about going back and rather skillfully looking at India's history and India's education systems. Um, and the whole place of art as quite central to the person or creativity as being quite central to an understanding of the personality and a way of being. And bringing that back into, into how we speak about play. So that it's not an external humility that we're attaching to it, but it's coming from really understanding the material. And then in a sense, the problem with the galleries becomes quite irrelevant because we have to make our own galleries, so we have to make our own spaces for that kind of practice. Sorry, that was very long and convoluted. But it's the idea of the skills and the humility that seems to emerge from them, that Indian aesthetic thinking seems to draw from as a starting point. There are areas there, I think, for us to look at. I don't know how you feel about that, or just about skill, the importance of it. Yeah, I mean, skill is extremely uh, important. It's, uh, you know, for a, for a while, the art schools were not teaching drawing. And um, how do you express yourself if you don't know, if you don't have, how do you write if you don't know the alphabet? How do you express yourself visually if you can't draw? And this whole movement against drawing, um, I think it's now, it's now come, come back again uh, from the London Art Teachers of Glasgow, Edinburgh. So, <laughs> you can tell us more about that. But it's the same thing with clay. Um, sometimes one gets so involved with just learning the, you know, um, how to pull a handle, how to make a lid, um, how to find a lid. So these are important. Um, so it's, I think how how we're going to end it is you know is to 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 learn all that and then to still have the vision.
and the artistic vision to take it forward and to add in your personal expression in, into it and to then share a vision of what you have to say using the material. And it can only be done in that material. You see, I mean, if I'm supposed to be, if I have a choice of, you know, sort of working in any other material, but I have something to say, the, what I have to say as an artist, I can only say it actually in clay. It's honest in clay. There's, there's again, there's again a value, you know, coming through. Uh, but there, it seems to be an honest marriage between the two, um, you know, of what I uh, choose to express and um, actually use of the material. I don't think it would be the same in metal, even though my friend, my friend Radhakrishnan is here. It's not the same in metal, you know. It's not the same working in wax. It's not the same working in any other thing. Um, so. Yeah, but it is for him. It is for him. So it's very personal. It's it's highly personal. But the amount uh, of um, reach that clay has to the everyday, to the age group, to I think it's it's an amazing material um, because a child can use it, a very old person can use it. You know, it it goes sort of beyond age, beyond gender, beyond nationalities. It's something that is, you know, it's because it's off the earth that we are made of ourselves. So there's an incredible link with clay, and I feel very privileged that um, that I found it so early during my life. Um, and I plan to be a weaver. But, uh, well. <laughs>